All right, everyone, I think we're going to go ahead and get started, if you all are good. All right, I'm, hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm with the City of Bloomington, and we are so excited to have you here at the Illinois Main Street Conference, in case we already haven't said it enough. Um, but today's session is being live streamed, just as a reminder, to the museum's YouTube channel. And so this is a session on public art. So after urban sprawl and other contributing factors left downtown Bloomington with kind of minimal public art, uh, local artists began to occupy aging but architecturally significant buildings, bringing the life back into the area. In the years since, the local arts community has continued to flourish within downtown Bloomington, with more than 20 art galleries and artist studios and roughly 20 public art installations Downtown Bloomington has become an arts destination. In this session, some of the local leaders um, and our artists, Joanne Goetzinger, uh, Martha Burke, Michaela Harris, and Tricia Stiller will discuss what it took to coordinate, create, and fund public art in downtown Bloomington, reviewing the past, present, and future of public art in our community. Michaela is gonna go ahead and introduce these lovely ladies on the panel. Thanks, Hannah. My name is Michaela Harris. I have the very unique uh, pleasure to work both at the McLean County Art Center and the McLean County Museum of History, which is why you see me standing here today. But it was my distinct honor to be able to work with these ladies, document the history and the story of public art in our community. And I'm so excited and honored to uh, introduce to you Joanne Getzinger, a local artist um, who also has dedicated a lot of her life and time into um, uplifting our downtown, um, specifically through the DBA. Um, Martha Burke, another local artist who has also served on the DBA with us. And then Trisha Stiller, who was the executive director of the DBA, a wonderful theater professional and an all around amazing woman. They all are. So um, without further ado, we're going to jump right in. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, so a, as Hannah mentioned, public art in downtown Bloomington has been an integral part of our landscape really since the early 1900s with the first installation of Trotter Fountain, which was designed by Laredo Taft, one of the 20th century's foremost sculptor, sculptors. Uh, the fountain was dedicated in 1911 in front of the Withers Public Library. Now, sadly, the library itself was demolished in the 1970s, but the fountain remains in the public park that bears its name. Around the time of the library's demise, artists began taking up residence in downtown at a time of devastating urban sprawl. Uh, in 1967, Bloomington got a shopping mall and all of our major retailers migrated to the east. And in some places, at, 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 when that happened, in some places one could actually find more pigeons than people in our downtown and our crumbling building stock. But artists can always see possibility and always inspire hope, and that's exactly what they did. In 1997, our late mayor, Judy Markowitz, made downtown revitalization her focus. She recognized the importance of the city center, its history, its architecture, and she had a vision for so much more. She spearheaded a large-scale public art exhibit called Corn on the Curb, which, ins which was inspired by Chicago's Cows on Parade, if you remember that to mark the city's sesquicentennial. Initially, there were 17 six-foot-tall corn cob sculptures displayed around the square. The following year, due to public demand, a dozen more were added. <laughs> so imagine that. They were huge. Some of them you can still find around the downtown. Um, I think Pam has one at the Eaton Gallery. Um, in 2001, the city purchased the Scottish Rite Temple, which was renovated and reopened in 2006 as our Bloomington Center for the Performing Arts. And that same year, our city opened the U.S. Cellular Coliseum, which is now Grossinger Motors Arena. In 2005, downtown Bloomington was accepted into the Illinois Main Street program. Rebranding itself at that time, the Downtown Bloomington Association, we had previously been known as Bloomington Unlimited, Uniquely Bloomington, and the Uniquely Bloomington Downtown Association. But we landed on DBA, and that's where we remained until the end. So 
Following the four points of the Main Street program, the DBA Design Committee quickly emerged as the most driven and passionate of our working committees. Art walks and gallery gatherings soon became a regular offering for the community, bringing people again into the downtown and, and reintroducing uh, those who had forgotten and the new folks who had arrived. Creating a sense of space while drawing attention to the growing number of downtown artists and residents was of the utmost importance to the design committee. So we worked hard. We successfully lobbied for additional funding from the city of Bloomington. And we were very proud of that. <laughs> and we sold live holiday greenery every year to raise funds. And we successfully uh, received a, a significant grant from the Illinois Prairie Community Foundation uh, to continue our efforts towards public art. And that's where you come in, Joanne. <laughs> um, our first project we did uh, was in 2012. And Martha and I had uh, owned a gallery for nearly five years. And we thought we knew a lot of artists. But when we got started, we found out that there were not just a few, there were hundreds of artists, literally, in this community. And uh, people had sort of been ignoring that. I mean, there are certain groups that did things, you know, smaller groups and so on. But to really, to really um, emphasize the whole thing, we decided to do this bigger project, which would show uh, the art of 41 artists. And we solicited uh, applications from people. And uh, we had to lay out this, as you can see, it's a complicated setup. And it had to be laid out. And then people signed up. Artists signed up for a specific spot. And it was interesting because we had certain problems that came up during the process of this. Um, the artists had to sign up, first of all, for the space that they wanted. Some of them were way up on top, and some of them were way at the bottom. And so we had to use scaffolding. And uh, they also had to sign up for the time that they would work because the scaffolding had to be moved to their space. And so we ended up with people working in the middle of the night with a light and whatever. And uh, sometimes I would go down and check on them to make sure they didn't fall off or that they were okay. Nobody was hassling them or, or anything. So we, um, we worked very hard to get that done and we finished that. And then we had a dedication. And this picture you see, um, oh, it's on the left there, was at the end of that dedication. Some of us were still there. And so they took a picture. <clears throat> also at the bottom uh, of that page, Marlene Greger and Carol, or Karen, it's Karen, isn't it? Um, Karen were in that picture because Marlene had just finished her her uh, part of the mural at the bottom there. Okay, we had about three different uh, processes that we used that were variously successful. I want to say that the one thing that we found in all the processes is you always have to use the best quality materials that you can because murals are inherently a little bit unstable. You can't keep them forever but you can keep them a long time. And that large mural, you can see it was done 10 years ago and it still looks like it did the day we got it done. So um, always go for, and we have some handouts back here if you wanna start a program of your own that tell you all the paints that we used and the processes we used and how to do it. So it could sim really simplify doing your own project if you want interested in that. Um, this next one that we did, oh, can you go back to Ashley's? This was a low-hanging fruit thing that we did. Um, Ashley Freeland did this one. We did it on a process that we found out about from Philadelphia, which is probably the place in the country that has the most public art like this, murals. Um, and it, you put, they had a certain kind of canvas. It's made out of plastic, I think. You paint on that, and then you glue it on the wall. And it, it's kind of complicated to do, and we had a really 
wonderful handyman slash artist who worked with this Vince Bobrovsky, and he did the hanging of these. He called Philadelphia and talked to the people and drove them crazy, really, until he got all the information he wanted. Anyway, hers we did first, which was good because it's kind of small. The window had been blocked up already on that hat building, and it, there was cement in there that was kind of flat, so it was real easy to start with that one. Then we did Jeff Little's, which is an enormous painting. It, it doesn't, even when you see it in person, it doesn't look as big as it is. And that was done um, at the Creativity Center, which belongs to Bloomington, um, and they were in the process of revising the, the, the building, and so they had a room that we could use, and that, that took the entire wall on one side of the room and another wall, and he painted on it all winter long. And this one was one that was requested by the people who, had, who owned the building. They had different ways of coming at things. Ashley's, we decided to do. This one, the people wanted us to do, and they even came over and picked out images of Jeff's that they liked, and, and they painted it sort of, he painted it to suit what they wanted. Um, the next one is um, we decided to sort of resurrect two people that were on a mural that has been destroyed during um, the renovation of a building. And so, of course, you recognize Abraham Lincoln, and most of you know who David Davis is. Uh, he was a friend of Abraham Lincoln and also Supreme Court Justice. And he, uh, he convinced Abraham Lincoln to run for president. So we thought it was interesting to put the two of them together. And this was another system that we used, which we uh, painted on plywood. And we did this because, for two reasons, really. Because the artist wanted to take the painting to his garage and to work on it at home. And then uh, he brought it to my studio, and we, we covered it with many coats of, of uh, varnish so that it could be protected. And the other reason we decided to use plywood was that it's under an awning. If it wasn't under, under an awning, you wouldn't want to use plywood in a weather situation. So um, those two uh, were that third process that we worked on. Next. Uh, traffic control boxes. We wanted to do all the traffic control boxes in town. And we contacted the city. This is the first time we'd worked with them. And we had a little bit of pushback about this because somebody at the city was afraid they would distract drivers and cause wrecks. And finally, they gave us permission to do four. And then unbeknownst to us, one of the reporters from the Panagraph newspaper talked to the same person and said, now we can do a real nice article about how you're having your boxes painted, or we can do an article about why there are only four. <laughs> and, and he, oh, oh, well, they can do more than that. So we got permission to do them all. It's nice to have backup, even if you don't know about it at the time. <laughs> yeah. um, so we had 12 boxes to paint. We had 11 artists to paint. Um, Joanne and I did the, the priming for the boxes, which mm -hmm. was kind of a nightmare, but... Nightmare. <laughs> but it was good, we got it done. Then at the end of the painting these boxes, to show the change, but what happened between the time right before we did them and afterwards, the city got so many compliments on the boxes and they were so happy about it that they asked us to do this utility box that's next up here. And she had done one of the, you can see the elephant she did down in the square. That was the utility box, or the traffic control box. And then she did this. She is from India, and she used images from Indian folklore on there, which really connects to our enormous in population of Eastern Indians in our town, which we're lucky to have. OK, who's next? I can't quite see what that is. Okay, it's the art in the oh. landscape. Sorry. Oh, art in the landscape. Yeah, that's me it's again. again. <laughs> uh, we did. Uh, I'd like to point out that, and anybody who's in this business knows this is true. But you couldn't do any of this without an enormous amount of volunteering on part of many, many people. Um, some of the things that we did, like the flower pots, the person who did that spent, did it for 15 years, organizing all the volunteers to plant things in the flower pots and 
get them watered and taken care of all summer long. I had somebody who worked on the tree wells plantings. We had, Joanna and I have been doing, at, at the corner of Market in Maine, there are flower boxes and things around there. We've been doing that for years because it's right in front of the big composite mural and we didn't want that to look nice and everything down there to look terrible. Mm -hmm. So we volunteered to do that. We had a scarecrows and fall decorations subcommittee that, that worked on getting everybody to put things in there in the fall. Uh, we were involved in holiday decorations, which Marlene Greger and Joanne and I went to the city hall and talked to the mayor and begged him for money. And he, he gave us just like one penny under the amount that he would have had to go through the council for. <laughs> so we had $24,999. If it's 25000 he has to ask permission. So, which has been great because part of it they gave to Parks and Rec to do some of the work and part of it they hired somebody to do the polls, which as Karen knows, we did those polls for two years and be out there in the wind and the cold strapping stuff onto the light poles. It was a hard job, but, <laughs> but we got it done those two years and now it's done professionally. Are you talking about Crossroads? Is that next? Mm -hmm. I can't see that well enough to tell. Crossroads. Um, Crossroads, Crossroads was another way that Crossroads people approached us and they wanted us to do murals on there. And we had decided before that not to do murals that were an ad for the business. And so we talked to them about that and they were fine with, it, with paying for it themselves. And we had our friend Vince, the one who hung the other arts and things. He's also an artist, and so he did the one on Crossroads, which turned out really nice. Um, so we had many different ways of going about getting to each art piece. Trisha's talking. Okay. And then, Trisha, you're up. Yeah. So um, Martha just talked about, again, our friend Vince Brabrowski, who ended up being a, a fantastic partner on multiple projects for us, and that just goes to speak to the importance of public and private partnerships. Um, Crossroads, the business, of course, they're a global fair trade business. I hope you've all had a chance to visit them. Um, when he did their front facade, it really kind of opened up the door to other opportunities for us to display our um, our open heart here in Bloomington, and, and we are very passionate and a welcoming community, and, and so the, the art kind of led the way to those messages being then um, realized for us. So um, in addition to this um, Crossroads piece, um, I had been approached by another nonprofit uh, group, the McLean County Diversity Project, who had some students that were looking for a project, and we had we had some naked uh, sp wall space that really needed to be beautified. Um, and so uh, I talked to Vince. He agreed to lead some student workshops with these diversity students, and they successfully created uh, this corner piece on on the corner of Olive and Albert Streets, right across from our public library and city hall. Uh, that just kind of displays. Um, uh, if you look very closely at that mural, you'll see some historic buildings that no longer exist, and it kind of tells not only our story, but the story of each student. And the, the diversity project, um, which is, you know, you can read more of their history on the Not In Our Town website, um, comprised students from all over the community. Some were homeschooled, some were, had, were in private school, uh, some of course were in the public schools, and they all come together, they all share their stories, and they inspire we older folks to kind of open our hearts and minds. So having Vince lead those workshops and have this be our lasting impression is very, very important to us. And it was just our first, uh, well, it wasn't our first, but it was, again, continuing our efforts to, to grow our ability to collaborate. And uh, our next collaborator, um, we're very fortunate in our community to have a total of four murals created by global artist Joel Bergner. Um, he grew up here, so he's very keen to return when we ask him to. Um, but the very first uh, two projects that he did are right here in our downtown. Uh, the first one, uh, entitled Phoenix, is located literally across the street at 121 North Main. 
Um, and Joel worked with the students at our regional alternative school, also located here downtown. And he also, he, he, he led a series of workshops. He got input from the students on what, what, their, what their story was and what they wanted to tell. And of course, um, the imagery of the Phoenix and how these kids are overcoming a great deal of diversity and still finding their way. And um, Joel, um, is an educator and organizer of public art initiatives with youth specifically all over the world uh, and he empowers students to express themselves through art so and this is the other um, mural that he has done in our downtown this is actually on the wall of the regional alternative school campus uh, itself and he has since done two other projects in our town um, and again I, I can't even believe we have four Berkners in town and the other one is at the um, uh, wrote, uh, Market and Morris underpass as you're heading west out of town, you may have seen it, and one is at the entrance to Miller Park. So um, again, it's uh, Joel and his work uh, has really left an impression on our landscape and tells our story for us, so we're very happy. Um, this really is a very exciting time to be involved in downtown, and it's partly because there is a real synergy going on. So many things that developed have sort of all come together. You know, we have the farmer's market, we have First Friday, which started in 2008, and we added the events that we already had to First Friday, which was a holiday vignettes event, and the tour to chocolate, and some other things. Then we added more things, like Cogs and Corsets uh, steampunk event, which came directly from the first Friday, but turned into its own full weekend. We have, of course, McLean County Arts Center. We have the uh, Museum of History. We have spring and fall art walks, and that grew out of a round the corner art walk, which has been downtown for 22 years and became incorporated in, and invited everyone to join in. Uh, the city's involvement has increased with their work on the flower pots and the holiday decorations and the tree wells. There's been a lot more enthusiasm from them for downtown and the beauty of downtown. There, um, downtown has always had kind of a layered usage during the day. Of course, we have lawyers and, all that, and businesses, and then in the evening we have art walks and all, the, all of our functions, and late at night we have the bars and the music scene, and the, we have a really great music scene here, too. Um, there is a, a currently a downtown artist consortium that is, is working on future events, current events and future events, and I'm sure they will continue this work really well. It's a great time to be here. It is, Martha, thank you. And lots of those artists are here in the crowd today. Um, so we wanna open it up now for any questions uh, that you might have. I'll bring the mic around, uh, if or Hannah will, but no, oh, perfect, right, close. Thank you for your presentation. Um, quite remarkable, uh, all of the beauty and the art in downtown. Thank you for sharing the story and, and how you've gotten here. Uh, one first question is, how are you funding this work? How are you funding all the mural work and the downtown planting and the holiday decorations? Do you want to feel that? I can try. Well, um, prior to um, the DBA becoming a part of the city's community development department, we, we were seeking grants. Um, we had membership dollars that helped to fund. Um, we sold holiday greenery. Um, we actually took photographs of some of our public art and made uh, calendars that we sold at holiday time. So every little bit was helping in that regard. Um, I don't know if maybe Hannah wants to address the, um, the, the city's efforts to continue the pro projects. So currently now, it's basically, it's all paid through the city, essentially, because they really invested into the program because we got such compliments by all the work that the DBA did prior um, to expand downtown's beautification. So yeah, it's all paid through the city now. Well, the, the DBA itself has formally been dissolved, so yeah. So, but the city is still an accredited member of the program. And
and economic development. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Question. I'm just wondering the process you used for your call to artists, like how you got that out. Mm -hmm. uh, the, call, the call to artists to participate, you should really talk about that. Yeah. Oh, the call to artists? Mm -hmm. Use the uh, mic, Charlie. Well, each time we solicited, each time we solicited artists, uh, we sent out, I would say probably 300 emails to artists that we knew, and we encouraged them to tell other people and then we had uh, a special um, application for each project. And there are some copies of what it was up here on this table back here. Um, but we would picture whatever it was that we wanted to, to develop and give them kind of an idea of what it was going to be, uh, about how much we would pay for it, um, let's see, what else? Well, they'd have to give all their information why they were qualified, and then they would send a picture or two of something that they planned for this space, and that's, that's what we would do. And then the, uh, the mural committee actually was three people, Martha and I and, and another person, and we would look through all these applications. Sometimes we got a lot, sometimes we didn't get so many. It kind of depended uh, what the project was, but then we would select the best ones and take it to the committee and they would discuss it and decide what, who would do the work. One thing I forgot to mention while we were going through the different projects is we always let the landlord or the owner have the last word. Yeah, that's true. We present them something that's and they true. can either say yes or no, go back to the right. drawing board. And usually they took it. Yeah, I don't think we <laughs> yeah. ever had anybody say no. Yeah, One thing we did have, though, the thing that you glued up on the wall, we did, we did only use that twice because most landlords didn't want something glued on the outside of their building. So I, that was a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think my question is actually more related for the city, um, but just curious as to how you're involving the public in the decision-making process now going forward, since it's all public funds? Are you doing surveys to find out um, what images it is the community wants to see? How are you deciding, um, you know, what those final images and, and projects look like? Uh, my coworker, Catherine Dunlap, has actually been here for longer, so she's going to have a better answer for you. So as far as the public art, the city has not done any public art since coming into this, um, since we, the staff of the Downtown Bloomington Association joined the city of Bloomington in 2017. We mostly work on the Christmas decorations and the plantings in the district. And we work with our parks department's um, horticultural department to division to come up with a plan for it. And then we go out for a quote system. We do a request for a quote from all of our local growers to see who would be willing to do that. So we have not, like I said, not done any public art since doing this, but there is going to be a formal process within the city that is being finited at this time. Going forward, we would have public opinion included, though. She said they don't have any. Well, they haven't done any since it's been part of the city. Um, I was just wondering if you had brought, uh, done any work with bringing sculptures into town? We, we have. Um, in fact, um, we have a beautiful, and I, I, I don't know if it, we had a picture of it, on that there's a beautiful sculpture called Convergence of Purpose in front of our Bloomington Center for the Performing Arts. Um, and it, it features um, Abraham Lincoln and Judge Davis. And uh, it's, it's stunning. And, and not in our downtown, but we also have just erected, and it's the same artist, um, uh, a tribute to Bloomington's firefighters, uh, which you can find in, in Miller Park. And I know Herb Eaton has um, just done a wonderful freeze um, right in the middle of the 400 block of Main Street on, on Main Street Yoga's um, building. And it's, it tells a, a beautiful story. And I know Pam Eaton is here, so she might want to speak to that. Um, Pam, are you, Pam, you were here. Are you still here? Do you want to speak to Herb's sculptures? Hold on. 
We've been downtowners for 51 years, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to help encourage more artists to bring their art downtown, not only in their own individual studios and galleries, but also to the outside of their buildings or their sidewalks. And some of the roadblocks that we have found, many of you are going to find in your own cities. When you go to the cities and you say, I want sculpture, I want art, you'll be told there's liabilities, who's going to pay for the insurance, uh, who's going to be responsible if there's a mural on the wall and it gets damaged or it doesn't last. So um, your best bet would be to start, in my opinion, talk to your building owners. Go directly to them. And that's what we've done. We own uh, a downtown building. Some of you came last night. Uh, it's 411 North Center. So the images that you see up here are images that my husband did on the building because he wanted art down here. And so his opinion was, well, then I'll just put it on my building. Um, then, um, as Joanne and Martha had said, working with Crossroads was a business where they also wanted art and murals. So they actually paid themselves to have the work done. And the bottom piece down here, which is the frieze called Meditation on a Ball of String, the owner of that building actually commissioned Herb to do that piece. And then she and her husband actually worked with Herb to have certain designs put in that they wanted. So communication is real important. I think having a dream and a focus is important, but don't give up. Uh, <laughs> but just keep your communication going and work with your local artist. If you have them in your community, that's the best place to start. There are some other sculptures in town, too, that we didn't mention. There's one right outside the, the History Museum here of Abraham Lincoln on a bench. That's a Rick Harney sculpture, which has been really popular. And there are a number of them at the McLean County Art Center, too. Yeah. Sculptures. There, and there's one more, if I can jump in. Uh, sure. One more in process. I'm Doug Johnson. I'm the director of the McLean County Art Center. Uh, I'm happy enough to have Michaela on my staff. And uh, I'm currently the chairperson of a committee that's looking to install a sculpture actually on county grounds at the former site uh, from actually into the 1970s of the old YMCA, which the circus acrobats used as, as their training ground. And Andrew Jumanville did the Lincoln Davis Fell uh, sculpture in front of the BCPA in Lincoln Park and other sculptures in the community. Uh, has come up with a maquette for that, and I've met with uh, uh, John McIntyre, the county board chairman, and they are in uh, agreement on general terms to move forward on that sculpture, but it would be uh, an elevated sculpture of acrobats preparing to lift off uh, at that corner of Washington and East Street uh, with a lot of illuminated lights so it would have a sense of, of movement It'd probably be about 24, 26 feet tall, tall enough that you could see it, tall enough that it wouldn't be a road hazard for people driving, uh, but also uh, tall enough that, that uh, yahoos wouldn't try to climb up it and, uh, and play. So that's ongoing. There's a lot of great projects, and, and we're really early in a community to uh, be looking at, at public art. There's been a lot of effort to move forward, and, and Joanne and uh, Martha have done a great job. There's you know, a lot of other uh, great projects. And I'm excited about the upcoming circus uh, sculpture. So uh, if you go to uh, Bloomington Stars Take Flight, you'll see a maquette of, of that sculpture and information about the project. It's Bloomington Stars Take Flight. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, to establish the public art in this community, it's really been an all hands on deck effort. It's not one entity, it's not just the city, it's not just the artists, it's not just the business owners. It's really a collaboration um, of them all and we have some really exciting things coming up. In addition, um, we've got Tom Kirk, who is an artist in town, um, working on a sculpture park just right, side out of, right outside of downtown. So uh, lots, of, lots of fun stuff. Uh, do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah, we do. Is the city funding all of that as well? No. So that's Yes. Mm -hmm. um, concerning funding, you might check with your um, community foundation if there's one in your community. Our, the Illinois Prairie Community Foundation has a fund for public art that will help fund uh, art in the community. So in Springfield, um, I'm past president of the Springfield Art Association. 
past president of Downtown Springfield Incorporated. You put those two together and you get public art. Um, we did an art alley, and I was going to ask if you all had investigated that. I know Elmhurst, it was the first one I ever saw, and that was a very long time ago. If you have a built environment and you don't have vacant walls, where else could you do this? What's the worst part of every town? It's the alleys. So we've done one. We're in the process now of working on our second one. But more importantly, the Springfield Art Association brought us groups that we otherwise might not have seen. And that is the high school mm -hmm. and college art programs. Mm -hmm. And you get the kids involved. Now, college students are a whole nother group, but that's the buy-in for the next generation that as soon as we're not taking care of this stuff, they, you know, they could say, I did that one, right? So please don't sell yourself short on resources that are available in your hometown. So if you've got a community college, we have University of Illinois at Springfield, we have Lincoln Lake Community College, we have three public uh, high schools. Springfield High, I think, got a national award several years ago for one of their students that won that scholastic contest, right? For the whole country. So that's another way for outreach and buy-in in everybody's hometown. So understanding that you have quality issues and if, if private property owners want to do it, we kind of want to have a finger in it to make sure that it's uh, appropriate, right? And, and fits in and isn't, <laughs> well, Anyway, you know about that. But by working with, and I think we're the counterpart to the McLean County Association, Springfield Art Association, we, we work together. Anyway, so that's another piece as you go home. Who else can be a part of this? And if, if, if the high school kids get into it, that's, that's a win in my book, right? Because then they're telling all the, hey, they bring their uh, peers down, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's what we did in Springfield, we're, and we're still expanding on that. So uh, just to expand on a couple comments um, from our experience. Um, so I love the idea of going to a, a private property as opposed to public property, as my counterpart up here knows. Um, there's a permanent dent on the wall from where we've been banging our heads um, with public art. Be Oh, yes, because, and I'm with the city, so I'm guilty by association, but nothing frustrates me more. So anytime we kept proposing sites and proposing, you know, where people could see it, it was just roadblock, roadblock, roadblock from the city. So we just kind of thought, all right, we'll just move it three feet back on private property that the public can see. So that was one way we were able to kind of overcome that hurdle. The other thing, to echo your comment <laughs> of involving the students, um, that also helps alleviate the budgetary side, especially um, in our side. Um, you know, some of these murals and, and projects, there's, there's a lot of zeros behind them, so that can kind of be prohibitive. Um, we have utilized our metal arts program, industrial arts program, and artists um, for multiple uh, projects, bike racks, like cool bike racks. We're at train town, so all our bike racks look like trains. Um, but uh, we'll get onto that later. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, a lot of, of, of metal, metal cut butterflies and our parklets, just opportunities for the high school students to get involved and actually physically leave their mark. But the benefit is, is it cost us like 5% of what it normally would cost us. We just had to cover supplies. And so that was a wonderful opportunity for us to get that involvement, but also get more exposure and get more attractions from the public art side. They're less likely, uh, if the kids are involved in it, they also own it in a different way, and they're less likely to damage it. They're less likely, you know, like their friends know they were involved in it, so they're less likely to damage It's just, in general, a mm -hmm. great opportunity. It's true. It's absolutely true. One last question. Um, this one goes back to your corn on the cob. So I know you have the artists who painted the cobs, but did you work with a, a woodwork, wood mill in order to actually carve the actual cob itself? Um, this is something I've been trying to do for our downtown area, wanted to do a parade of trains. Mm -hmm. And so who did you reach out to in order to 
construct the actual Cobb itself? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I know um, it's a little bit before my time, but I do know that they did reach out to a fabricator. I know that um, I'm not sure if these were constructed out of wood, I think they were fiber fiberglass, um, and, and I know Chicago has a fiberglass fabricator, um, and they do giant size, things like trains. I think Batavia's Bulldogs uh, might come from there. Um, so you might want to do uh, a search, um, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure the name of the artist or company that provided our corn curbs. Maybe Doug, and do you I, remember um, by any chance? Actually, we're lucky enough to have Miss Marlene Gregor here, ah. who uh, was coordinated that project, so I'm going to hand the mic to her. What do you want me to say? Oh, I couldn't hardly hit the question. Oh, the corn on the cob. Curb. Oh, the fabrication. Oh, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had two. The first one was for 12 ears of corn. And I didn't know where to go because there is no fabricator in Bloomington. So I went to Professor... Um, his name is Hank Campbell at the university and said, could your students do it? He said, no, we don't have the facility, but I know a man in Lexington, which is a little town over here. And we went there and uh, Mayor Judy Markowitz brought up a very nice ear of Illinois corn for a model and we wanted one seven feet tall. He says, no, I am the artist. I'm going to make a chubby six foot one. Well, we had a little problem there, but uh, we finally got the corns up. Then the next year, Judy says, I'd like to add some more. So we had a little more. Do you know a better fabricator? So in the parade, there was a little uh, display from the Illinois corn growers and they had a little ear of corn on the back of a truck. I asked them, where do we go? It ended up in Rockford. So Judy Barkowitz and Barb Atkins and I went up there, and oh, it was a beautiful facility. Everything was fine. They did a seven-foot corn. We got them back, put them on the pedestals, and they were too weak. The wind was blowing them over, so they had to fill them all with foam and it cost a lot more money and I was not in good stead with Barb Atkins after that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, the Chicago cows got their fabricated uh, first off in, uh, uh, it was um, overseas at, um, oh gosh, um, Switzerland, believe it or not. And then I don't know where they did it from there, but it's a long story, but it was sort of funny, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it was. Thank Thanks, you, Marlene. Marlene. Um, that is, and I want to point out up on the screen here, you can see Marlene and her late husband, Harold Gregor, with Cornman Miranda there on the right. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Gregor was uh, influential in the arts in this community, so we're very glad to have Marlene with us here today. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. Um, we've, like mentioned, have got handouts as well as maps up here at the front if you'd be interested. And we've got lots of artists here, so if you have more questions, feel free to chit-chat before your next session. Thank you.